Hey, what's up guys? Hope everyone had a great Memorial Day weekend. I am sweating because I've been watching game seven of the Warriors and Rockets, so apologize. But uh, it's halftime, so here we go. Bring my solve with a an explanation of to why I'm sticking with it, which is that I believe Fenn is hinting that he has some parallels of being wrongfully accused with Kidd and with Richard Weatherall, but also that Richard Weatherall is the Indiana type that he's looking to inspire, someone that will kind of, someone that he can pass the torch to, so to speak. And treating the poem as though it is either the chapter that's missing for Fen's self as a path to his uh, burial site or, or a place that he would like to die, or treating that as the chapter that would have been dedicated to Richard Weatherall, who I think that he was inspired to fall in the footsteps of. Richard Weatherall lived between the years of 1858 and 1910. He moved west with his four brothers, Al, Wynn, Clayton, and John, and their parents. The Weatherall family ended up building one of the most successful ranches in the Mancos Valley of Colorado. They settled in the southwestern region of the state and built up their ranch, which they named the Alamo, translated to the poplar. Richard became the head of household at age 25 when his father, Ben, died unexpectedly. The ranch they built sat at 6,500 feet above sea level. And because of that, during the months of November through January, the Weatherall family needed to take their cattle to lower elevations to graze. They built a seasonal camp at the lower elevation where they began to grow relationships with the Ute and the Navajo Indians. Eventually, Richard was able to become fluent in both Ute and Navajo and built his relationship, earning trust from the natives. While looking for stray cattle in 1888, Richard discovered what is today known as Cliff Palace. He made the discovery while moving from Cliff Canyon into Navajo Canyon along a small trail that started at a spring in the head of Cliff Canyon. Richard had been told about the ruins from a Ute Indian at his seasonal camp. Although his brother Al had seen the ruin the previous year, he and Charlie Mason were credited with the discovery because they entered the ruin. Upon entry, Richard and Charlie discovered that the ruin wasn't in complete disrepair. It looked like the natives that were there had decided to up and leave in the middle of their activity. The second discovery made on the same day was Spruce Tree House. Also located in the Mesa Verde National Park, Spruce Tree House exhibits the same abandonment evidence that Cliff Palace showed. As Richard Weatherall decided to dedicate more and more of his time to studying and researching the cultures which he had stumbled upon, he began to ask for funding. He asked the American Museum of Natural History for funding or expertise to be sent to southwestern Colorado to help with his research. The museum accepted his offer for artifacts but declined to send expertise or funding in order to help his cause. This put Richard in a tough position. He had to decide if he was going to continue his research or abandon his research and eventually decided to put together collections of artifacts which he could sell in order to fund his own research and continue his new personal passion and keep his project going. He secured funding from two Hyde brothers, H-Y-D-E, when he put together a large collection and took it to the 1839 Chicago World's Fair. With the funding, Richard was able to transition into full-time archaeology, but through his practice of self-fundraising and selling artifacts and tours in order to keep his research going, had already gained the reputation of a looter. Richard's trip to Grand Gulch was the first project that the Hyde brothers funded. At Grand Gulch, Richard was able to work with a Swedish scholar, Baron Gustav Nordenskjold, who taught him some of the principles of archaeology, such as diagramming and putting together sketches as he was finding things in order to transition from a process that was dedicated to finding artifacts into a mindset that was dedicated to understanding the daily life of the people that had left them behind. In Grand Gulch, Richard made his most significant discovery. He discovered the basket maker culture, which predates the traditional Pueblo or cliff dwelling culture that you think of in the Four Corners area. This is the first time when we can understand Richard's firsthand point of view because he began recording his thoughts and what he was doing on a daily basis and letters that he wrote back to the Hyde brothers who had funded his project. The only way to get to the ruins was through a three-day pack mule trip and because of this they were extremely remote uh, explaining why he was the first person to dedicate time to researching them. When drawing parallels between Richard Weatherall and Fenn you can look at his discovery of the basket maker culture just like Fenn helped discover Clovis points and 
push back the dates of early Americans. Throughout this process, Richard Wetherill's reputation as a looter grew more and more potent. Think back to Fenn's reference of Captain Kidd and Fenn being raided himself as being part of, or potentially part of, the black market of Native American artifacts in New Mexico. Captain Kidd was also accused of committing a crime. He was operating as a privateer and accused of being a pirate, eventually hung and displayed as an example to deter other pirates. But ultimately it could be argued that Kidd was wrongfully accused. Therefore he stashed at Gardner's Island for protection to keep himself alive so that if someone wanted to take that from him, it could be leverage in order to fight for himself. Fenn was wrongfully accused and Richard Wetherill believed he was wrongfully accused as well. He believed that he was doing academic research, learning about a culture that no one had discovered, while the natives and some white folks in the area had decided that he was looting. In 1896, funded by the Hyde brothers, Richard Wetherill made his way to Chaco Canyon. He began at Pueblo Bonito, eventually coining the term Anasazi and putting together detailed field notes, which we can look back on today. He worked with a counterpart named George Pepper, who was the head archeologist of the group. But in fact, Richard was the one uh, doing the daily tasks and performing the archeology, span a fact that you can find out he resented through some of the letters that he continued to write to the Hyde brothers. In 1907, Richard Wetherill gladly relinquished his claim on Chaco Canyon, providing that it became a national park. Teddy Roosevelt proclaimed Chaco Canyon National Monument on March 11th, 1907. One of Richard's partners had accused a Native American of stealing a horse, went to that Native American's house and confronted him. Throughout that engagement, his Richard Wetherill's associate, who accused the native of theft, ended up pistol whipping him at his own house. As a result of that engagement, Richard Wetherill ended up being murdered by a Navajo man named Chis Chilling Begay in 1910. He was brought back to his porch, and three days later the sheriff showed up and started trying to piece together what had happened on that day. It's difficult to say, but we know a couple facts. Richard Wetherill died empty-handed, almost completely broke, and was buried in a location that he had chosen years before something that he had made, made known to the point where his family was able to bury him in that location without prior knowledge that he was going to be murdered on that day. If you think back to the bells that Forrest Fenn makes, one of them reads, he who dies with more than $50 is a failure. Comparing that to Richard Wetherill dying nearly broke is one of the parallels that I've put together throughout the two men's lives. The last piece that I think ties these two men together is the memorial to Richard Wetherill's death. Held in 2010, this was a remembrance ceremony for Richard Wetherill, which looked back at the life, accomplishments, and eventual murder of the man, but also coincides with what many people think is the date that Forrest Fenn buried his treasure. All right, I got through a video in a half time. Be proud of me. Thank you everybody who subscribed. I see you out there in some comments, so keep them coming because I do appreciate it.